Hey everyone, welcome back to the RP Games YouTube channel. My name is Ralph and this is Pathfinder Kingmaker. Yeah, I know, I just can't stay away from this game. I recently completed the main story. I didn't have the DLC, so I figured why not just add some more episodes, go through the DLC as well. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play through Farnhold's Slot. Now in this DLC, you are... You're playing in the same universe, obviously, in the same story as the main story. However, uh, you are playing through a, a part, which I will assume is the the Farnhold Vanishing chapter. And you're gonna do that from the perspective of Mygar Varn. Not necessarily himself, you're playing one of his uh, close lieutenants, if I'm not mistaken. But you get to experience what happened in Farnhold. Now apparently what you do in this DLC affects the main story. Now in my case that's a bit too late of course since I already finished the main story but still uh, I didn't want to rob you of more Pathfinder Kingmaker content and to be honest I, I didn't want to rob myself of more Pathfinder Kingmaker Let's uh, let's jump into the Farnhold Slot DLC. While celebrating your victory at Jaman the Eldori's mansion, you met another hero of the Stolen Lands, the mercenary captain Mygar Varn. While you build your barony in the Shrike Hills and the Neural Marshes, Varn and his people established their own nation of Farnhold on the plains of Dunsworth. What challenges do they face? Play this story and the main campaign will reflect the consequences of the choices you make. So let's head into that. Uh, yeah, difficulty wise I'm just gonna keep it the same as uh, I did for the main uh, storyline. We are going to create a new character. Uh, it gives you the option to import your main character. You will see in a, in a moment why that is important. Uh, I found a build. I, I have no idea how the DLC is going. If there's going to be a whole party. Uh, which characters are going to be it. Which classes. I have no idea. So I figured I would create a character that's a little bit of... Um, um, that can do some combat and can do some spell casting. I found a, a really nice build. Again, I I don't make these builds myself. I'm not much of a rules person. Uh, so thank you very much to Arcane Agent. I will link the build in the video description below. And we are going to create a, uh, a rogue. And it's going to be a tiefling rogue. And I really like this image. So that's the one we're gonna go with. So the tiefling, I'm, I'm just gonna read through all of this because I, I haven't done that yet. Uh, so let's see. As a tiefling, we have fiendish resistance. That means that we have a cold resistance of five, electricity resistance of five, and a fire resistance of five. Very nice. We have the tiefling heritage. Although many tieflings follow the general model of the tiefling, Many more do not. Those of different lineages may evince dramatically different manifestations of their heritage, both in appearance and in ability. Others have particularly strong heritages tied to specific fiendish races. So, simultaneously more or less than mortal, tieflings are the offspring of humans and fiends. With otherworldly blood and traits to match, Tieflings are often shunned and despised out of reactionary fear. Most tieflings never know their fiendish sire, as the coupling that produced their curse occurred generations earlier. The taint is long-lasting and persistent, often manifesting at birth or sometimes later in life, as a powerful though often unwanted boon, <laughs> like the boon of having horns and a tail. Yeah. Despite their fiendish appearance and netherworld origins, tieflings have a human's capacity of choosing their fate 
And while many embrace their dark heritage and side with fiendish powers, others reject their darker predilections. Predilections. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, it's the still the same old Ralph with the same old English skill. Though the power of their blood calls nearly every tiefling to fury, destruction and rot, even the spawn of a succubus, can become a saint and the grandchild of a pit fiend, an unsuspecting hero. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what uh, what path we are gonna take. Uh, let's see. We I played a, a male character in the main story. I'm gonna play a female character in the DLC. Uh, body type is fine, I guess. The face. Let's take a quick look. We have three choices here. Oh, I like this one. I like the yellow eyes. Yep, that's gonna be the one. Uh, the skin tone seems fine. What this right now? Oh, you could go very light. Oh, this is actually, it's more like a dark elf uh, look. Yeah, that's quite nice, actually. Uh, yeah, we're not a smurf, so let's go with a dark elvish look. That's cool. All right. Uh, we have horns. Let's see. <laughs> this is more, a lot, more or less like the picture, but they just look really silly. These are a bit small. These are quite nice. It's either this one or that one. Depends. If, I, if I'm if i planning to headbutt a lot of people, these horns may be nice. But I think I'm going to go with, with these ones. They're a bit less pronounced. I don't know. Yeah, looks good. Uh, the horns also have colors. Oh, really? Um, ooh, we can have dark horns. Oh, okay. I like dark horns. Yeah, let's go completely dark. We're gonna be a rogue, so I mean, we're probably gonna need sunglasses if we if we want to be stealthy, because otherwise. <laughs> Uh, everybody's gonna see us coming through our uh, our bright flaming eyes. But uh, yeah, I like this look so far. Let's see, hairstyles. What do we have? That's it? Okay, yeah, we're gonna stay with the first one then. And then the hair color. Let's see... Blonde is not what I have in mind. Oh, the hair color could be fiery. Yeah, that looks not too bad, actually. White is a possibility. It's not going to be blonde like that, for sure. That is very red. I think I like... Uh, uh, yeah, I like the fiery orange the best. So let's let's do that. Yeah, that that goes really well actually. All right, let's uh, let's head on to the class. So we are gonna start off as a rogue. Now I'm not quite sure how many levels this DLC will will contain. So I don't know if there's going to be a lot of level progression. I know that we are going to start off, I think, as level 4 or 5. Uh, so I need to pick a number of levels here. But uh, yeah, let's see. Let's let's try and get uh, 3 levels of Rogue, 2 levels of Wizard. And then we can go into either Arcane Trickster or... Even Eldritch Knight, probably. That's maybe also a possibility. So, we're gonna start with a rogue. And we're gonna go with the Knife Master. 
The Knife Master is a trained killer who specializes in close-up combat and the wave and weave of knife fighting. In her hands, daggers and other similar light blades become truly deadly instruments. There we go. We have... Um... Oh, that looks really nice, actually. I like that. I like that a lot. Let's see what other colors we have here. Well, the blue is not bad either. Okay, but it's not going to change the cape. It's, uh, it's the underlying clothing. Green is not really... Hmm, I kind of like the darker version that I had earlier. What if we do red? Hmm. No, I prefer this and then let's see, can we make that this is dark red. I I do like it when it's a little bit more flashy, like a yeah, this is fine. All right, so we look uh, really good. That's important. Style points count. So what do we get? We get uh, rogue proficiencies. Rogues are proficient with all simple weapons, plus the hand crossbow, rapier, sap, short sword, and short bow. They are proficient with light armor, but not with shields. We get weapon finesse from the start with a light weapon, elven curved blade, astok or rapier. Made for a creature of your size category, you may use your dexterity modifier instead of your strength modifier on attack rolls. Okay, that's going to be important because we want uh, a high dexterity. The sneak stab. A knife master focuses her ability to deal sneak attack damage with daggers and similar weapons to such a degree that she can deal more sneak attack damage with those weapons at the expense of sneak attacks with other weapons. When she makes a sneak attack with a dagger, kukri, punching dagger, star knife or sai, she uses d8s to roll sneak attack damage instead of d6s. For sneak attack damage, uh, for sneak attacks with all other weapons, she uses d4s instead of d6s. Oh, that is very nice. Okay, so what uh, the the idea is to have uh, double wielding uh, kukri. So that means that we're gonna get d8s for our sneak attack damage. That's really cool. And then we have, of course, our sneak attack. If a character can catch an opponent when he is unable to defend himself effectively from her attack, she can strike a vital spot for extra damage. The character's attack deals extra damage anytime her target would be denied a dexterity bonus to armor class or when the character flanks her target. This extra damage is 1d6 and increases by 1d6 at later levels. This additional damage is precision damage and is not multiplied on a critical hit. Character must be able to see the target well enough to pick a vital spot and must be able to reach such a spot. Okay, that makes sense. As uh, class skills, we have uh, mobility, uh, athletics, persuasion, trickery, knowledge, world, perception, stealth and use magic device. Now, if I want to go into Arcane Trickster, we need Trickery and Mobility at uh, 4 ranks and Knowledge Arcana at 4 ranks, so that's important when we're selecting our skills. We need Sneak Attack 2, so that means we need uh, 3 levels of Rogue for that. And we need the ability to cast Arcane second level spells, so that's why we're going to go into... A wizard at a later moment and if we want the eldritch knight 
Uh, we need to be able to cast arcane spells of third level. And we need the martial weapons proficiency. Uh, we're gonna need to take that martial weapons proficiency anyway, because it is needed uh, for fighting with Kukri. So let's head on to the next step. We can choose a heritage. Now there is this um, Clipbot spawn. I, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, the Motherless heritage, which is pretty creepy. No woman survives the birth of a babe whose Clipbot ancestry has emerged. At best, Clipbot spawn rip their mothers apart during labor. At worst, they tear themselves out even earlier. Yeah, it, I'm going to play a, a really like a super sociable character. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> nothing, nothing weird going on here with uh, with this character. Uh, motherless have a plus two racial bonus to strength and wisdom, a minus two penalty to intelligence, and a plus two racial bonus on mobility and lore nature checks. They can use the blur spell once per day. That's a really cool ability. They gain a secondary bite attack that deals 1d6 damage. Uh, so yeah, so not only did we uh, bite our way out of our mother's womb, we can use it in combat too. So <laughs> there we go. We are uh, officially a motherless bastard. I don't know. It's not sure. Yeah, well, why, why not? We are going to put our strength at 13. Our dexterity is going to be, let's see, 17. Constitution is 10. Our wisdom is going to be 9. Our charisma is going to be 8. And the rest is going to go into intelligence. So we have 13, 17, 10, 16, 9, 8. The skill points that we're going to choose are mobility, Trickery, Stealth, Knowledge Arcana. So Mobility, uh, Trickery and Knowledge Arcana were needed for our Arcane Trickster build, if we want to go that direction. And then we're going to pick Perception, because it's uh, used a lot. Persuasion, we might need that since our Charisma is 8. And then use magic device. <clears throat> we are gonna go with two weapon fighting. So your penalties on attack rolls for fighting with two weapons are reduced. The penalty for your primary hand lessens by two and the one for your offhand lessens by six. Normally, if you wield a second weapon in your offhand, you can get one extra attack per round with that weapon. When fighting in this way, you suffer a minus six penalty with your regular attack and a um, minus ten penalty with your offhand. If your offhand weapon is light, the penalties are reduced by two each. An unarmed strike is always considered light. so. Since we want to wield dual Kukri, we're going to go two weapon fighting. Let's, um. Enemy approaching! Yeah, let's have a pragmatic voice. Uh, the birth date is, uh, let's see. Let's make that the 26th. And then we'll take 26th of Rova. <clears throat> Why not? Uh, our tiefling character is going to be called Valry. And we are going to be, let's say, maybe chaotic good. Uh, yeah, why not? All according to plan. There we go. That's our first level. At second level, we're going to go back into Rogue. We are going to go into these uh, Mobility Trickery Stealth, uh, Knowledge Arcana, 
Perception and Persuasion. And then as our ability here, we are going to go for a combat trick. And we'll pick the Martial Weapons Proficiency. And as you can see, it mentions uh, Cookery there. So that's why we're taking this. Set for level 2, level 3, again, Rogue, same skills. <clears throat> and uh, one point, then use Magic Device. Now, uh, let's see, we need... Double Slice. Your offhand weapon while dual wielding strikes with greater power. Add your strength bonus to damage rolls made with your offhand weapon. Normally you only add half of your strength modifier with your offhand. So let's grab um, <clears throat> double slice and then we're gonna take finesse training in the kukri. Whenever the rogue makes a successful melee attack with a kukri, she adds her dexterity modifier instead of her strength modifier to the damage roll. Uh, if any effect would prevent the rogue from adding her strength modifier to the damage roll, she does not add her dexterity modifier. There we go. And we also get blade sense. At third level, a knife master is so skilled in combat involving light blades that she gains a plus one dodge bonus to armor class against attacks made against her with light blades. This bonus increases by plus one for every three levels to a maximum of plus six at 18th level. Not quite sure if we're gonna, if we're gonna reach 18th level. But still, nice to have. Fourth level, we're gonna dive into the wizard. We're gonna take a regular wizard. While universalist wizards might study to prepare themselves for any manner of danger, specialist wizards research schools of magic that make them exceptionally skilled within a specific focus. Yet no matter their speciality, all wizards are masters of the impossible and can aid their allies in overcoming any danger. Sounds good. Master of the Impossible, Valry. Master of the Impossible. Yes, that's uh, that's one title that I can add already. That's very good. Let's see. We get a wizard bonus feat at first, fifth, tenth, fifteenth, and twentieth level. At such a opportunity, we can choose a meta magic feat, spell focus feat, or any other spellcaster feat. The wizard must still meet all prerequisites for a bonus feat, including caster level minimums. We have a number of cantrips. These spells are cast like any other spells, but they are not expended when cast and may be used again. We can choose a specialist school, gaining additional spells and powers based on that school. This choice must be made at first level, and once made, it cannot be changed. A wizard does not, uh, that does not select a school receives the Universalist school instead. Each arcane school gives the wizard a number of school powers. In addition, specialist wizards receive an additional spell slot of each spell level he can cast from first on up. Each day, a wizard can prepare a spell from his specialty school in that slot. This spell must be in the wizard spellbook, obviously. A wizard can select a spell modified by a meta magic feat to prepare in his school slot, but it uses up a higher level spell slot. Wizards with the Universalist school do not receive a school slot. Wizards are proficient with the club, dagger, heavy crossbow, light crossbow and quarter staff, but not with any type of armor or shield. Armor interferes with a wizard's movements, which can cause his spells with somatic components to fail. We have an arcane bond. At first level, wizards form a powerful bond with an object or a creature. This bond can take one of two forms, a familiar 
or a bonded object. Familiar is a magical pet that enhances the wizard's skills and senses, while a bonded object is an item a wizard can use to cast additional spells. And we have Detect Magic. Detects magical auras of active spells or artifacts, can identify the school of magic to which the spell belongs, and this is used in dialogue options. So we are gonna choose to be a uh, universalist. Let's see, wizards who do not specialize have the most diversity of all arcane spellcasters. Hand of the Apprentice, you cause your melee weapon to fly from your grasp and strike a foe before instantly returning to you. Oh, that's a cool one. As a standard action, you can make a single attack using a melee weapon at a range of 30 feet. This attack is treated as a ranged attack with a thrown weapon, except that you add your intelligence modifier on the attack roll instead of your dexterity modifier. This ability cannot be used to perform a combat maneuver. You can use this ability a number of times per day, equal to 3 plus your intelligence modifier. Uh, let's see, we have Meta Magic Mastery. At 8th level, you can extend or alter the range of your next spell as though using the extend or reach spell feat accordingly. You can use this ability once per day at 8th level and one additional time per day for every two wizard levels you possess beyond 8. I'm gonna skip the rest because I don't think we're gonna reach like 12th level or 16th level. I don't think that's gonna be uh, a part of this playthrough. If it turns out to be, then I can still uh, read that. As a familiar, we're, we're gonna choose a hair because it gives us a plus four bonus on initiative checks and a plus two bonus on perception checks. So perception, always a very crucial skill. And uh, an initiative bonus is always super welcome. There we go. Our ability point is going into dexterity. And then we have uh, three points. So we're gonna put that in mobility, trickery, and knowledge arcana, which means that at least from a skill rank uh, perspective, we fulfill the, the requirements for arcane trickster. Our um, wizard bonus feat is going to be extend spell because our extended spells last twice as long already as a universalist. Did I understand that correctly? In any case, extend spell it is. And then we need to pick a bunch of spells. Let's see. Vanish is always interesting. Uh, so we become invisible for a short time with Vanish. True Strike. Uh, we gain a temporary intuitive insight into the immediate future during our next attack. Next single attack roll gains a plus 20 insight bonus. That is very welcome. Uh, we're gonna take Stunning Barrier. Closely surrounded by a barely visible magical field, the field provides a plus one deflection bonus to armor class and a plus one resistance bonus on saves. Any creature that strikes you with a melee attack is stunned for one round. Once the field has stunned an opponent, the spell is discharged. Uh, shield is always nice, a plus 4 bonus to armor class. Reduce person. This halves the height, length and width uh, and divides the weight by 8. Decreases uh, The decrease changes the creature's size category to the next smaller one. The target gains a plus 2 size bonus to dexterity, a minus 2 size penalty to strength and a plus one bonus on attack rolls and armor class due to its reduced size. Melee and ranged weapons used by this creature deal less damage. And then... Let's see... 
What else? Expeditious retreat. Uh, this increases the base speed by 30 feet. So, yeah, that is handy if we need to run away. Not that I've done that quite a lot in the uh, in the main playthrough, to be honest. But hey, here we go. And then level 5, we're gonna grab a second level of wizard. Let's see, as you can tell, we have uh, our sneak attack 2. And we have the, the skill ranks needed for Arcane Trickster. And uh, so the only thing we still need is to be able to cast Arcane Spells at third level for Eldritch Knight and at second level for Arcane Trickster. Uh, where do we go from here? So mobility... Is fine. I think I want to put a point in trickery. Uh, max out perception and then max out persuasion. As a feat, we are gonna take combat expertise. You can choose to take a minus one penalty on melee attack rolls and combat maneuver checks to gain a plus one dodge bonus to your armor class. When your base attack bonus reaches plus four and every plus four thereafter, the penalty increases by minus one and the dodge bonus increases by plus one. You can only choose to use this feat when you declare that you are making an attack or a full attack with a melee weapon. The effects of this feat last until your next turn. That is that. We need uh, two more spells so we can take uh, a large person here. Uh, so this is uh, pretty much the opposite from a reduced person. And we'll take uh, Grease. A Grease spell covers a solid surface with a layer of slippery grease. Any creature in the area when the spell is cast and every round after that must make a successful reflex save or fall prone. So and that is one minute per level. So with our, um, if we would put an extend spell on that, we can double that. Very nice. There are some stories that resemble the last fleeting beam of sunlight as the sun sets in the fog. It gleams and disappears, leaving perhaps a bright trace in someone's memory. One such story is a town called Farnhold. And I, an author still unknown to you, shall convey it in every truthful and exciting detail. Lords and ladies, today we are here to honor three brave people who have done the impossible. They've tamed the stolen lands. Baron Hannes Drelev, the new master of Glenabon, Captain Mager Varn, the conqueror of Dunsward, and finally, the tamer of the Shrike Hills, who put an end to the atrocities of the Stag Lord's bandits. Step forward. So this is why we had to uh, import our main Restaurant, character, because this is actually Gren, the character from the title. main story. Rise, your grace. He didn't bring his uh, Smilodon this time. <laughs> On behalf of the people of the free city of Restov, I confer upon you this noble title. Rise, your grace. Careful with that blade. Thank you, Lady Aldori, distinguished guests. It is a great honor for me. It is with the greatest joy that I announce the founding of my barony in Dunsward. It shall be called Varnhold. Hooray! But I must say that this happy event is not mine to claim alone. The Stolen Lands would never have yielded to me if it weren't for the valor of my friends and companions. 
Now I would like to introduce my right hand, a hero without whose help I wouldn't be standing here now. Please, step forward. All right, so we're going to be the right hand. Oh, nice bow there. We're going to be the right hand of uh, Mygar. Let's see, can we speak to uh, any of these people? Today we raise our cups to Varnhold. I only look forward to the day that we raise them once more to celebrate an independent Rustland. We have Castle over here. It's high time that Varn and his people were rewarded for their many feats. I'm glad that moment has finally come. So you're the famous Falri. I am. I am pleased to finally meet you in person. Farn has told me much of your deeds. Uh, yeah, I almost started reading this with uh, Gren's voice. <laughs> Let's not do that this time. The Varling host fought for your interests many times, but we haven't had a chance to meet in person yet. It is a pleasure doing business with the Varling host. You offer honest swords for honest gold. You do charge a fair amount, but this means I won't have to worry about someone else buying you out from under me. Alas, not many mercenary teams can boast your reputation. And the Varling Host is a mercenary group led by Mygar, obviously. What do you hold for the future of Farnhold? I only wish I knew. We live in a wild time of great changes. The rise of new states in disputed lands will be a shock to the entire region. Of course I have my own thoughts and plans, as everyone does, but there is only one thing I'm sure of. There will be no risk of a boring future. Allow me to return the question. What do you think awaits your young barony? Uh, probably a lot of work. Much difficult and dangerous work awaits us, if we are to survive. You seem to have both your feet on the ground. It's good to see that Farn has such people around him. He's never lacked courage, but practicalities have never been his strong suit. I wish you luck. Thank you, Lady Eldori. Uh, let's see, who else can we talk to? Is uh, is the whole party here? Hannes Trellef is here, let's speak to him. Oh, we're fast. Rootless upstarts, okay, yep. So just as great a conversationalist as in the main storyline here. <clears throat> Bunch of guests, more guests, more guests. These are all guests. Let's see what Lander has to tell us. Varnhold it is then. I'll be curious to see what you managed to build there. I might even pay you a visit in some time. All right, that's good. As Vani Creek, this is uh, the High Priest of Arrestal, if I'm not mistaken. Building houses, setting hearts, and turning wastelands into bountiful fields. These are all pious acts. May Arrestal aid you. Alright. Oh, here is Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay. My friends won the head, but I stayed to chat with the heroes of the Farling Host. Who would have imagined that you have accomplished so many feats? I hope somebody makes a song about you too. Why don't you do that, Lindsay? If you write with us, maybe, spoiler alert, you won't turn into a book. <laughs> <laughs> and here is Keston. Well, Tertuccio, well, scum, how did we, huh? I may have had one too many. Yeah, that sounds like it. Chandra Merve, from mercenary to baron, well, there are some noble families with even humbler beginnings. Okay, that's, at least that's not a disparaging remark. Natala Sartova gives you a cool but mightily curious look. 
as if you were a peculiar animal at the zoo. Falry, right hand of Mygarvarn, hero of the legendary Farling host. They say your courage is only matched by your ingenuity. Is this true? Let's uh, be very polite here. You are too kind, your highness. I see you are not only daring, but well-mannered. A rare combination of virtues, especially among people in your trade. Hey, I'm all about... Um, Deception. Your commander is certainly courageous, but doesn't think clearly about certain matters. He bluntly refused to take envoys with him. As he thinks his young barony can survive without allies. Do you think there are reasonable people in his new baron's circle who understand how important diplomacy is for the state? Ah, uh, well, I'm not gonna stab Mygar in the back. I mean... If that is my commander's decision, I can only support it. Loyalty is commendable, but still, sometimes it can be useful to look around and see where your lord is leading you. Is it over a cliff? <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for the vote of confidence, Natala. <laughs> In any case, for now, this is just empty rhetoric. Your young state must first prove that it is worthy of diplomacy. I suspect we shall revisit this conversation in a year or two, if by that time the name of Farnhold can still be found on the maps. What do you think of today's reception? I suppose Lady Eldori and Lord Mersolimius are very happy with this affair they've managed to plot behind my back. Ooh. Along with their new toy baronies, honestly, I should remind them who rules Bravoy and call an immediate end to this entire farce. Do you know why I haven't? Because it would have been a terribly obvious and crude response to Restov's maneuverings. On a battlefield, you wouldn't seek to do the very thing that your adversary expects and has been preparing for, would you? But I assure you, sooner or later, we will make our move. Just not today. Hmm. Intrigue. So what are your thoughts on the future of Farnhold? You're addressing the ruler of Bravoy. I don't guess anyone's future. I determine it. <laughs> oh yeah, I like her attitude. But as for Varnhold, truth be told, I'm still thinking about what to do with you. We'll see how you deal with the lands you've received. Okay. Have a safe journey. I wish your barony happiness and prosperity. Well, thank you, uh, Lady Sertova. I uh, appreciate your well wishes. Uh, let's see. Who do we have here? This is Mygar and this is... Cephal Laurentis, I have no idea who that is. Although the name does ring a bell, it, it does appear in the um, main story as well. The name at least, I don't, I don't remember the character, but you know. It's been 90 episodes, you know, I'm, I'm allowed to, to forget one or two characters. <laughs> in fact, I couldn't even remember the name of one of the main characters in like one of the last episodes. So, you know, that's... How I deal with things. As the guests linger and entertain themselves, one hero of the occasion stands be stands aside. Mygar Varn, the leader of Farling Host, your direct commander, and henceforth the undisputed Barn, Barn, the Barn of Farn, the Baron of Farnhold. He's uh, busying himself with one of his favorite pastimes. He's trying very hard not to yell, but he's ferociously arguing about something with the party's co-founder, a wizard named Cephalorentis, Varn's oldest companion and most uncompromising opponent. But Varn, my dear friend, would you please be so kind as to explain what devil take you you've been doing? I finance this venture with my own personal funds, not to mention all the effort and time I've invested. 
And pray tell, what was it all for? For you to assemble the fruits of our labors and pitch the whole lot down the privy? Fruits? I've been busy guarding these fruits from Brevoy's incessant fruit moths. But I'm a baron now. We finally have our own land. For the first time in our lives, we're independent. No one can tell us what to do. And you want to destroy everything we've achieved by inviting spies into our house? Of course! Why not? Please, do come in, eavesdrop, sniff around, take whatever you please. Cephal is generous. He said, make yourself at home. Oh, Asmodeus, please give me the patience to withstand this nonsense, or take my soul already. Barn, what are you saying? What is this independence you speak of? We depend on Restov for literally everything. From the inflow of settlers to the food to feed them. I like Jamandi no more than you do. But it will take us years to free ourselves from her influence. Right now we must bow to our patron. Brag about a title we received from her very hands. Listening to you is disgusting. Did we claw away our own piece of land only to keep toiling away for all those... Ah, friend! You're right on time. Come, be our arbiter. <laughs> Uh-oh. What are you arguing about? At issue is the fact that Jumandi Aldori has generously offered to make the use of her envoy. And who is Jumandi Aldori? The very same one who created our barony, and who could make it disappear with a flick of her finger. An insignificant figure in the grand scheme of things, no doubt. But Gudvan refused her. And to top it all off, he rather suggestively hinted that he considers every single one of Brevoy's diplomats to be spies. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, the diplomatic approach of a true mercenary leader. What else should I consider them? Cephal, have you grown foggy in your old age? I can hardly recognize you. You've always been a hardliner. You've always put the interests of our ventures above everything else. And now you want us to roll over on our backs for the Aldori, wiggle our tails, and wait to be petted. We're an independent state now, and we shall have it known to all that we won't be ordered about. Yeah, you tell them, Vorn. Magar, Magar, of course they're spies. You refuse the spy in plain sight. Congratulations, well done. Now the Sword Lords will send other spies, ones we won't even be able to see. Restov has invested a great deal in our barony. He is ready to invest yet more. So why bite the hand it feeds us before the feeding is over? We could at least pretend to be humble, so long as we're still getting something for it. Uh, well, that is actually a good point. I mean, they're gonna send spies anyway. That That is true. And we might as well know who the spy is. Well, for one thing, that's low. By accepting Restov's <coughs> handouts, we're taking on certain obligations. I know you don't care a fig for morality, but think of our reputation. Who will want to deal with us if we steal from our employers and stab them in the back? Why do you keep saying us and our? Do I need to remind you that you're a badder now? That is the difference between you and me. You were born of a noble family, and yet even now, after receiving lands and power, you continue to think like the leader of a band of thugs. But I, my parents plowed the soil, and I learned to read by moonlight. But even as a snot-nosed child, I tried to think like a ruler, a king without a kingdom. After decades, my plans and schemes are finally bearing fruit. I shall not allow you to destroy everything we have created with your stupid pride. Well, since, um, you know, since it's Farnhold's DLC, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna side with uh, Mygar here. Hmm, Mygar is right. We must claim our rights at once, or we'll never climb out from under Restov's boot. I will tell you one thing. If you engaged battle as clumsily as you're playing politics, all of us would be long dead by now. Caution, restraint, tactical finesse. When you're on the battlefield, you seem to remember what these things are. 
How is it that you've forgotten all of it now? With all due respect, Cephal, I'm still the military leader here. You've called me hot-tempered and reckless many times before, pleading that I'll get all of us killed. But look around. We're still alive. Don't be a coward now. I know what I'm doing. That is true. You have saved us more than once. Apparently, in order to valiantly ruin not just a party of mercenaries, but an entire barony. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy the conversation between these two. All right, enough arguing. What is done cannot be undone. You spoiled my game quite a bit, Magar, and I will not forget it in a hurry. We shall try to play with the hand we were dealt. Celebrations are over. It's time for everyday life. I suggest we exchange bows with the respected hosts and set off to Varnhold. We have much work to do. Let us go. Varnhold awaits. If we had a Brevin envoy with us, they'd be spying out the road to Varnhold for Jamandi. As if Jamandi best not learn where we live. If there were an envoy with us, I would already be feeding them misinformation. Oh, we have uh, our troops waiting for us. Hail, fighters! Hail, your grace! Farling hosts, my eagles. I've promised for many years that I would lead you to victory, and now I have. Hooray! You are a mercenary party no more. You are my personal guard, the best of the best. We will never fight for others' gold again. From now on, we fight for what's ours. The soldiers fall out and only Kier the Icebuck remains, looking as gloomy as ever despite the universal jubilation. The sullen dwarf is quartermaster and chaplain of the Varlan host, famous for her skill in dampening the commander's enthusiasm. <laughs> we have our own harem. <laughs> Welcome back, your grace. Did you have fun at the celebration? Have enough to eat? Good. Let's get back to work before you squander the whole barony. <laughs> you sound like Seifel. You should have gone with us. You would have liked it. I hate Restoff. Besides, while you were at the hall, or ball, another bandit gang slithered into town. And who would have taken care of it if I weren't here, huh? Anyhow, festivities are over. You're a baron now. Get to baroning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, baron. Get to baroning. If you say so. To baroning. Here's my first order. I shall appoint, appoint you, Kyrdi, as treasurer. You, Seifal, will be my regent. And you, Valerie, my general. Any questions? No? Alright, get to work. For a few moments, Mygar watches Seifal and Kyrdi go away, then looks at you. There's a mischievous twinkle in his eyes. Hard to believe, isn't it? After so many years of life on the road, nights in barracks and tents, I'm now a baron. With my own humble, baronial residence. It's wonderful finally getting a place to call home. All one can wish now is to have a family to go with it. Oh yeah, I'm going for a Baroness title here. My girl looks down and smiles faintly for a moment. Yes, because who needs an empty house when your only companion is an Echo? Well, our best days are still ahead. He becomes silent and grows pensive. Well, General, here is your first order. Talk to Kyrdi and pick three of her lads as your brothers in arms. I can't spare more than three for now. Someone has to guard the capital. Take the best. Whoever will follow you to hell and back. 
<laughs> he says to a tiefling. <laughs> when you've gathered them together, come find me at the fort. There's something I need you to do. Okay, that is going to be it for our first episode. I hope you are as curious as me as to where this story is going to take us. If you are, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the uh, Varnhold's Lot episodes. If you're enjoying the content, by all means, hit that like button. Thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next episode.